uh, we want to welcome Jeff Portnoy today. And Jeff, you are like the premier uh, media attorney in town in terms okay. of First okay. Amendment. <laughs> okay. So tell us about the, uh, the issues that are facing journalists today in, in Hawaii and elsewhere. Wow. How much time do I have to do that? <laughs> I, you know, I think there are a lot of issues. It just depends on, uh, frankly, a day-by-day -day, uh, situation. I think right now the most pressing issue is on Maui, where the publisher of a website has been subpoenaed to provide the identity of a poster who uh, posted what the police department believes are uh, serious threats against one of its police officers. And without making, in my view, any attempt to try to obtain that information from other sources, it has attempted simply to subpoena that information. And I think it has tremendous long-term significance as to how that ultimately winds its way through the court system. And we'll know more about that at the end of June. Uh, second issue deals with the longevity or lack of longevity of the current shield law, uh, which um, was extended by the legislature for two more years, still awaits the governor's signature. Last week, that looked very problematic. I don't know how much I can say, but I can say that um, I am now very optimistic that the governor will either sign the bill or at least allow it to become law without his signature. It is now going to go to the judiciary before the Rules of Evidence Committee, and we'll see what mischief they make of the legislation before it goes back to the legislature next session, hopefully to be made permanent in one form or another. Um, there's always access issues, the ability to get information from state agencies. Um, it just continues. So before we move on from the Journalism Shield Bill, can you explain to people what makes Hawaii's Journalism Shield Bill so uh, special to journalists here? Well, I think it depends on the definition of journalists. I think it is a far-reaching bill in that it uh, provides protection to so-called non-traditional journalists. Uh, the more traditional journalists are the ones who appear on the evening news or uh, write for a daily or weekly newspaper, but as everyone knows, um, there are now multiple alternative ways of obtaining news and information. This is one of them. Your um, site is another one. Mm -hmm. And our bill um, went beyond the traditional journalist to extend protection for revealing certain sources and other information to so-called bloggers, for lack of a better word. And it was the first state that did that. Um, it has been praised, certainly by the non-traditional journalists here and elsewhere. It has been criticized by some here for extending the privilege to uh, every housewife and house husband who decides to post something on the web. But in that regard, it is a very significant bill. As far as the protections that it offers, it is not um, out of line, I think, with the protection that is offered by many other states. It probably gives as much protection as most other states. It gives, as I said, protection to the so-called non-traditional journalists, which many states do not. The so-called protection it gives to non-traditional journalists does not extend as far as it does to the so-called traditional journalists. So um, it's a very good bill. It has now had three years of life with virtually no um, serious issues arising. We've only had one court case, uh, which extended actually the uh, privilege to a filmmaker. Um, and I hope that uh, once all is said and done, neither the judiciary nor the legislature will see fit to cut back on a bill which has actually been used as a model even in Congress as Congress continues its feudal journey to try to uh, 
pass a federal shield law. So how important is it to have a uh, journalism shield bill in Hawaii in terms of keeping investigative reporting alive and keeping uh, the, you know, journalists willing to, I guess, look into stories? Well, I think it's important. I I'm not so sure that it's absolutely necessary. I, I think it's quite complicated as to the political and judicial realities that caused Hawaii to pass a shield law for for a long time, there was very little impetus on the part of journalists to go to the legislature to ask for a privilege. Uh, the fear was that if you go to the legislature as a journalist and ask for something, then when those folks up there decide to engage in a little mischief and want to interfere with journalism, it's going to be hard to say, don't touch us. We're immune from uh, legislative action. But as a result of a change in the way courts were interpreting the journalist's belief that he or she had certain privileges which were not clearly set out in the Constitution or even in prior case law. Uh, the decision was made here, as it has been in now more than two-thirds of the states, that what journalists wanted was certainty. They wanted to have a privilege established either by judicial rule or by legislatures that would give journalists, and I'm using it in the most expansive way, uh, a guideline as to what information would remain privileged and when information that might otherwise be thought to be privileged would maybe be subject to compulsion. So I, I, I think it's, it's good. Um, I think only time will tell as courts begin to interpret it. Um, how far it goes or whether it will in fact um, be something that will encourage better journalism. But I don't think it would be a good thing for journalists to kind of rely on the shield law to do the kinds of things that they ought to be doing anyway. What about criminal protection? There's really no, in a criminal case, there's, this shield bill doesn't work, right? No, it works. Oh, it I does. mean, there's protection. Yeah, mm -hmm. under our shield law, for example, based upon the um, the extent of the alleged criminal activity. For example, there's no shield if the journalist himself or herself is involved in the crime. There's no shield or there's a much lesser shield if they have knowledge of a crime. Um, if the crime committed by someone else um, is a misdemeanor, then the privilege is pretty broad. Uh, it gets a little more murky the more serious the alleged criminal activity is and the content of the information that the journalist may have. And again, we're talking about two completely different types of information. One is the identity of a source. The other is information which the journalist obtains which is not published but which forms part of the journalist's files. And so there are different rules that may apply to those different types of, of um, information. Mm -hmm. And in terms of, uh, say, a, f a federal case, it, what is the It doesn't apply. doesn't apply at all. Then we'll go back to federal case law, which is constantly in flux. But generally, most courts continue to believe that there is some very limited privilege. There's a so-called three-part test that um, a prosecutor, for example, uh, would hopefully need to go through before he or she could get access. The three-part test is essentially that the information is absolutely critical to the investigation, uh, that uh, the person seeking the information has uh, attempted to obtain it from non-journalist sources, and three, has been totally unsuccessful uh, in that effort, and that it goes to the heart of the investigation. So on the federal level, that's essentially the three-part test, but there are some federal courts that believe there is no privilege to a journalist or for a journalist and will force journalists to reveal information. And we've seen some very um, famous or infamous cases just in the last few years, the Barry Bond steroid case in the San Francisco Chronicle, the Valerie Plume case, um, you know, dealing with, with the leak of the CIA uh, name and status, and courts there were not very sympathetic to journalists who um, did not want to reveal sources. Interestingly, even in Valerie Plume, even after the sources gave permission to have their identities released, certain reporters still felt that they um, 
could not be compelled to release the information. And they would have gone to jail, for example, in the Bonds case. Uh, but while that case was on appeal, the source actually came forward and identified himself. So it's because of the uncertainty of, of court decisions that, as I say, states and the federal government have um, either passed shield laws or have debated the validity of shield laws. So what do you see coming up in the future for journalists on this issue? On shield? Uh, yeah, just in the whole issue. I think it'll always be an issue depending upon how badly someone wants information and uh, how willing they are to go up against the media or uh, a non-traditional journalist. And this issue in Maui is huge. I mean, if the court in Maui is going to order this um, journalist to reveal the identity of an online blogger, I think it's going to have tremendous negative impact on all of journalism, whether it's the Star Advertiser's website or yours uh, or, or anyone else's. And so even though I am not involved in that case directly, I might get involved. There are some national organizations that are very concerned about it. Um, I'm hoping that that issue gets diffused very quickly. Hopefully that person who I understand can be readily identified if anyone spends a few minutes attempting to do so. I have no idea mm -hmm. if the police are watching this who it is, <laughs> but I understand from people who are involved that it's not very hard to find the identity and they've just taken the easy way out for them, which is to simply subpoena, try to subpoena the information from, from the journalist and uh, we, have to, we have to stop that. Okay, well, thank you. We'll have to have you on again in June, maybe. See uh, what the, the outcome is. The end of June. Okay. Thank you so much, Jeff. All right, that's it. Thanks. Thank you.